So we're delighted to spend some time today with our friend and colleague, uh, Jeff Halper. I'm on the ICAD uh, US, uh, USA board uh, with Jeff, and along with some of my colleagues who are here, Ken Boas, who's our board chair, I saw is on, uh, and Awad Abafata, both of whom are leaders in the One Democratic State campaign in Israel. So I thought we begin, I mean, most of our interviews up to this point here at Indiana Center have been with uh, folks in the West Bank, West Bank Palestinians. But today I thought it would be important for us to talk about uh, Jewish voice, voices of conscience, as well as Palestinians who live and reside within uh, uh, Israel itself and to see uh, what they're doing, especially in this time of the pandemic crisis. So I thought we'd begin by asking both Jeff and Awa to say a brief word of introduction about how they're doing during this time of quarantine. Jeff, you're speaking to us, I believe, from Jerusalem, and Awad, you from Haifa, uh, from your homes there. So Jeff, you want to begin for us, say a few words of introduction, and then we'll turn it over to Awad. Or the other way around, let Awad begin, maybe. A as you like. Fadal. <laughs> yeah, so to introduce myself first? Please. OK. <clears throat> Okay, my name is uh, Awad Abdel Fattah. Uh, I was uh, born in a uh, Kaukab village, uh, which is in north of Palestine, today Israel. Uh, and I can say that I am a descendant of a family who survived the ethnic cleansing, which uh, was supposed to be carried out against my the population of my village in 1948. And uh, I uh, studied uh, English uh, and language literature. I had BA in English and language, uh, uh, literature. Uh, I was qualified as a teacher uh, in a high school. And uh, I was fired for political reasons. I, the next the year after also, I was too qualified for another school. And also I was fired. And, uh, uh, you know, this also, uh, I mean, my firing for political reasons, in fact, reflects the policy of the Israeli authorities uh, against the Palestinians and uh, the policy which has targeted uh, the uh, cultural identity of Palestinians in Israel. Uh, I uh, became an active uh, in a movement called Abna al Balad, which is a Marxist nationalist movement. Uh, it was established in 72, uh, but I joined it uh, beginning 1980s, at the beginning of 1980s. And I became the deputy uh, secretary general of the movement. We advocated for one democratic state in all of Palestine. We considered ourselves part of the Palestinian national movement. And we, in fact, were affiliated with the PLO. Because of that, we were persecuted more than any other political party. And then after Oslo, we formed a new political party. My group, my movement, and other uh, groups uh, uh, came together and decided to build a new party, um, shifting our political thinking uh, temporarily at least, from uh, one democratic state in all of Palestine to a, uh, I am not saying two states because we never use the word two states for two peoples, but we said that since the Palestinian National Movement adopted or endorsed a one uh, an independent Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, so we said that it's okay, but Oslo was viewed by us as a catastrophe from the very beginning, and this is why we decided to build a party to uh, counter the consequences of this uh, agreement. I uh, uh, was uh, put under uh, surveillance uh, all of the time, and I was persecuted, uh, arrested several times, uh, even assaulted physically during interrogation and outside. And the uh, purpose was to break me out. Also my family, in fact, most of my family, consisting of uh, 12 brothers, 
and sisters besides my parents who died a few years ago. Uh, at least six of my brothers served several years in prison. So this was quite strange to uh, be done against a, a Palestinian citizen of the state of Israel because many people in the Western countries thought for a long time that Palestinians in Israel are enjoying equality and that their life much better than those living in the West Bank and Gaza Strip or outside. But in fact, this is a longer story that Palestinians inside the Green Line have been loving and are a uh, systematic policy of discrim discrimination and uh, internal colonization. So uh, today, uh, I, or, uh, I am uh, one of the initiators of the One Democratic State campaign. And uh, we thought that uh, there, is, there is a time to start this campaign with the hope that it can evolve over time to a grassroots movement that can be inclusive and can become a political actor, fictive political actor. So this is what we are doing in these days, uh, in the time of the pandemic, of the current pandemic, which is almost uh, crippling the entire globe. We are trying, in fact, to do political education uh, through the Zoom. But uh, as for the Palestinian side, the Green Line, because of the discrimination and because of the pandemic has revealed a long history of none of violent, uh, violence against us and of discrimination against Palestinians. So we uh, have been trying to organize ourselves, to rely on ourselves because uh, our health system and among the Palestinians is underfunded, is, is, is poor in relation to the health system in the, in the, in the Jewish sector. So uh, we, in fact, we, are, uh, we have uh, resorted from the very beginning to the, to the prevention. I mean, to abide by instructions uh, issued by the Ministry of Health and also by leaders, Palestinian leaders, so that we can protect ourselves because we believe that if the pandemic spreads, so largely, I think that it will be a catastrophe for Palestinians inside the Green Line, also in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, as you know. The, 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 the one point that I will later we elaborate, I would say that it's very important to approach, it has been important to approach, maybe today, what I'm going to say is becoming clear. It has become clear for many political activists around the world. But I would say that, uh, uh, to approach the conflict from the Israel relationship with its Palestinian citizens is very important because so far uh, political activists around the world approach the Palestinian uh, cause uh, as related only to those living in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Palestinians inside the Green Line and their status and their role uh, had been uh, overlooked and their role had, had been uh, underestimated. Only after the outbreak of the Second Intifada, which extended to the Palestinians inside the Green Line, uh, many people around the world started to realize that there is a real problem relating to the Palestinians under Israel, Israel state, because Israel uh, has been related to as the only democracy in the Middle East. And uh, while uh, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians have been languishing in a, a racist system, systematic system. So this is what we have been trying to do, is that to expose the uh, apartheid nature of the state of Israel, the colonial nature, so that people would know that the occupation in the West Bank and Gaza Strip is only an extension of this regime. Uh, it's not temporary. Uh, Israel is not a normal state from the very beginning. So this is what we are going to do. This is why today we are thinking that uh, we should uh, uh, speed up our efforts 
to campaign about the one democratic state in all of Palestine. Oh, I thank you so much. Uh, uh, you know, you're exactly right. Uh, uh, that's why it was important that we speak with both you and Jeff today, not just Jeff, but uh, when Jeff said that he was going to be in touch with you, it was important to have you on to talk about Palestinians uh, within, within Israel, not just the Palestinians in the West Bank. So thank you. Jeff, you want to say a few words of introduction uh, and uh, how you and your family are doing, and then we'll We'll uh, get to the questions. Oh, by the way, let me just, uh, we've already had a couple of comments uh, 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 from John Hickox. Political movement is not a human rights issue. Jeff, you've taught him. You've said it's, also, it's a political issue. He says he learned that from you. And uh, yeah, I'll get over to- hot dogs in Portland. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll get to Mark Braverman's question in a few minutes. So go ahead, Jeff, please. All right. Well, first of all, it's good to see you all. I mean, I, I've seen you all in the flesh, but uh, having you all together was great. Um, you know, I can. You know, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions um, has always been a political organization. You know, we're activists. You know, we rebuild houses. Some of you have been to our rebuilding camps. The, well, I won't mean to Kathy and a lot of other people of you have been there. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and you know the work we do in terms of analysis and writing and, and the speaking tours and films and different things that we do. But we've always been political. For us, house demolitions is a vehicle for how do you expose what's going on in the occupation? What are Israel's intentions? Uh, remember, because I've always said that, you know, Israel gets away with it by casting everything it does as security, defense against terrorism, we're only defending ourselves, and, and, and the house demolition issue breaks that apart, because of the 55,000 homes so far that have been demolished in the occupied territories in 67, literally less than 1% were demolished for security reasons. So it really, the house demolition shows that the occupation is proactive. Um, and, uh, and in fact, you know, that the Israeli intention is to Judaize the country. And this has been the last 125 years of Zionism. You know, the idea is to transform an Arab country into a Jewish country, to transform Palestine in the land of Israel, and we're right at the cusp of that being completed, that project, because uh, in June, according to the Trump plan, and according to the, um, uh, the agreement signed between Gantz and Netanyahu now with our, this new government, in, at the end of June, beginning of July, Israel will annex a good part of the West Bank, the major settlement blocks. Uh, and so, uh, and so uh, in a sense, uh, uh, the analysis we've had has been very good all these years, and it's always led us, I mean, like Awad and like others, in a way we supported the two-state idea, in that the PLO accepted it, Arafat accepted it, you know, I, I'm not going to be more Catholic than the Pope. <laughs> if it's good enough for Arafat, it's good, you know, we didn't like it very much, like Awad says, but we, we, we accepted it. But it's been clear now, I think to all of us, certainly, all of us here, that for the last 15 years or 20 years, it's gone. There is no two-state solution anymore. And therefore, uh, the facts on the ground, the political logic of it all, Zionism, the whole process of Judaization, is really all leading to what we have today, which is, which is a hybrid regime, let's put it that way, over Palestine, which is partly settler colonialism. And that's a very useful concept. We haven't talked about it very much. I'm writing a book about it now. But our whole plan of one state, of the one democratic state campaign that Awad and I are involved with, is based on a settler colonial analysis. The idea being that Israel from the very beginning, or Zionism from the very beginning, has wanted to, to take over and Judaize the entire country. There was never a two-state idea, and Palestinians were never really a side. Um, 
So you've got a regime of settler colonialism that wants the whole country, plus a regime of occupation of the last 50 some years with its whole dynamic and so on, plus a regime of apartheid that is now over the entire country. So we've really got three layers of an oppressive system. And what we're arguing in short is that the only way out of this, out of this is uh, by creating a single democratic state over the whole country. Now, not only is the two-state solution gone, but let me just say this one thing and then I'll stop. And that is that, you know, we keep talking about this as a conflict, the Israel-Palestine conflict or the Israel-Arab conflict, but it really isn't a conflict because a conflict has sides. You know, and there's no two sides. We've always said that. There's no symmetry here. It's not like the two sides are arguing about something and fighting about something, and then they can compromise and make peace. That's not the way it is. You know, in a settler colonial situation, it's unilateral. There's only one side, and that's the way Israel has always seen this. There's only one side. It's us. This country belongs to the Jews exclusively. There is no other side. And so... It, and so conflict resolution doesn't get to the, to the problem. Uh, the only way you can resolve this is through decolonization. The only way you, you, you end a settler colonial situation is to decolonize. And to decolonize, we've got a 10 point plan, our group, but basically to decolonize means to dismantle all the colonial structures of control and domination and then replace it by a whole new society, a whole new state, a new civil society that's shared. So I think our, our vision and our plan is very good. You know, we're one of the first groups. I mean, there's other groups around, one state groups, and we've built on there, and we're trying to make ties with them and work with them. But we've come up with a very detailed, logical, good, just program and we're hoping that that's going to give some focus to our movement because we can't just stay on BDS all the time and protests and this and that. We've got to have a political program and the Palestinians have to lead. So Awad's job more than mine is to bring the Palestinians into this whole, into this whole movement. Um, but that's kind of where we are. And let me say that in a sense, it makes sense that Palestinians inside the Green Line, 48 Palestinians, uh, have taken the initiative on this because in the occupied territory, you know, they're exhausted. <coughs> They've got not only Israel on their heads, they got the PA on their heads. They have very little space uh, for organization and for movement and so on. And so in some ways, the Palestinians, uh, you know, within the Green Line, have a certain latitude of speech and of movement and of organization that's, and they're not as quite as exhausted as, as in the West, and they're not under the PA as in the West Bank. So I think there's a logic why 48 Palestinians have taken the initiative of this project. End of lecture. <laughs> Thanks for that, Jeff. Uh, um, I would, uh, uh, I've heard Jeff say that a number of times that, uh, and uh, you've intimated it too in, in things that you've written along with Jeff that it's important for 48 Palestinians to take the lead. And uh, there's only so much Jeff can do, even though he's respected among Palestinians in Israel, uh, Palestinian activists. Tell us about your role and how's it going? Uh, how is it uh, in terms of enlisting other uh, 48 Palestinians within Israel to enlist in this project. Is the trust level there? Uh, are they skittish? I mean, talk to us a little bit about your role and how it's going. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as for the Palestinians inside the Green Line, the situation is very complex. And uh, uh, people should know uh, what uh, the complexities that uh, are uh, 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 faced by this uh, consequence, this uh, sorry, this constituency of the Palestinian people, you know, uh, uh, it's right that we started uh, uh, in Haifa as uh, mainly Palestinians from inside the Green Line, 
which relatively is successful. I'm not saying that it is a large movement and it's uh, gaining uh, momentum and so and so. No, it is an important group. And I just, I would like to say that, that just recently, two groups from, from Gaza and one from Ramallah contacted us and thought that we are the most serious group that we can lead. But this doesn't mean that we are really representing uh, large sections of the Palestinians either in Israel or inside the West Bank and Gaza Strip. But that is very encouraging beginning that we are uh, doing. But, uh, but uh, again, uh, uh, let just a few information about the Palestinians inside the Green Line. The Palestinians for a long time have been inside the Green Line, I mean, have been uh, taken out of the conflict. They were not considered as part of the uh, wider conflict they were considered as a domestic Israeli issue. And also, in fact, they perpetuated that. This is why we Palestinians at the Green Line, we were very angry and we responded to the Oslo with much, with harsh criticism. And we wrote against that from the very beginning. And we thought that this is a catastrophe because it neither uh, gives rights to Palestinians inside the Green Line, nor to the refugees. And it came, uh, it came later out that, that even an independent Palestinian state for which Palestinian, the Palestinian leadership rim was a phantom. I mean, was an illusion, was a big illusion. So if Palestinians inside the Green Line uh, uh, were, as I said, were overlooked, were marginalized by Israelis, by the Palestinians, and even by the Arab world. So we have been living through th three marginalizations, if it's true to say. And we have to face all this. And we have to prove to the world that we are part of the conflict, that we are living under a tight system. I mean, I'm not saying today, because until 1966, Palestinians lived under a tight system of control. We were under military rule. During the military rule, most of our lands have, were confiscated. 75% of Arab lands were confiscated. Today, we are left with only 3%. We are living in condensed enclaves. And we are uh, surrounded by settlements. You know, the policy of judaizations, which Jeff talked about, talked about, it's going on. So we are still living the consequences of the Nakba. The Nakba is, is, has not, it's not, did not cease in 48. For Palestinians inside the Green Line, it's continued. And today we are, at that time, we were only 150,000 people. We were leaderless, we were helpless. We, didn't know what to do. My fathers and grandfather telling us about the trauma they underwent at the time. They, overnight, they became a minority. They, lose their, they lost their homeland and they lost their relatives. 20%, for example, of my village are outside. My relatives are living in, 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 in Lebanon. And two of them were killed in, in, during the Israeli invasion in 1982. And my aunt came to look for the, one of the bodies, of the, because she never discovered where the body of one of them uh, ended. So, I mean, and she could not stay here because she was 80 years old and she could not stay here. She, is living, she was living in, in my village. She is my aunt and she could not stay, you know? So when we say that the refugees is very important and that we, the refugees, who are, it's we. I mean, we, the Palestinians of the Green Line, every family in the, inside Israel, every Palestinian family has relatives in the in the refugee camps. So this is why the issue of religious is not only a, a, a collective uh, uh, and, uh, and political issue, it is a human, humanitarian issue. It is, a, uh, it is an, a, a personal issue for me and for every person. So, I mean, now the Palestinians, uh, after uh, four or five decades of negligence of marginalization, suddenly Palestinians outside are waking up to a reality where the Palestinians inside the Green Line are playing an, a, a powerful political role inside Israel. So, you know, until even 1976, when land day broke out, many Arabs thought that we were loyal to the state of Israel, that we forget about the, our history, about identity, that we were traitors. We were suspected, we were suspicious by Palestinians and Arabs outside. But suddenly discovered that this group of Palestinians who grew, who have grown in number from 150,000 today to about one million and a half. Not only that, but they have 
uh, grown politically, they have more educated people, they can uh, manage their political struggle against the Israeli government. So we are creative, we are innovative in our struggle. So now they look at us as if we are going to save the entire Palestinian project, which in fact also it's an illusion. It's right that we can play an important, important role in the struggle for the entire Palestinian people. But that doesn't mean that we, it's us who can uh, uh, liberate the country or liberate the, 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 the people from uh, settler colonialism or liberate the Jews from their Zionist uh, ideas. So, I mean, but we are now really struggling, uh, trying to exploit our uh, status, our uh, place inside the Green Line in order to effect a change either within the Palestinians in Israel or the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. At the same time, also we believe that in the future we can play also an important role in, in terms of our relations with the Israelis because we are familiar with the Israelis. We have intimate relations in the places of work and so on and so but but also we should know that the Israeli society has become more extreme, more rights, and more even is closing to fascism. So, and, and, and the results of the elections doesn't only uh, uh, reflect uh, the political game between, two, between parties, but also in fact reflects the, 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 the fundamental changes that the Israeli society have been undergoing. So now we uh, are trying to navigate through these complexities through, the, through these difficulties, but we believe that we can do that. And this takes time. We shouldn't be naive to believe that this would uh, happen in, in a few years. This will take maybe a generation, but we can really pave, build the way, build the path, path of a, a different life, different political life where Palestinians, uh, in, in, including Israeli uh, uh, progressives who can join the struggle and we can open a new horizon for the next generations. Thank you, Awad. Jeff, uh, I want to combine a couple questions I've been receiving with a question I wanted to ask you. <clears throat> so uh, um, uh, the questions are from Mark Braverman and Linda Ramston. And I'm going to combine them with, with the questions that I, I had uh, as well. So you mentioned about your relationship with other one state groups. And for those of us in the West, unless you really study them, you know, in minute detail, they all, you know, you hear one state. And so they all seem very similar. Talk to us about your relationship with other one state groups. What sets yours apart? And, this, and you alluded to it before, but talk a little bit about the strategic vision and plan for uh, the one Demo the ODS campaign, your campaign, uh, and then what we can do to be supportive. I know there's an awful lot there, but but you, you get you get the gist, right? Uh, yeah, of what I'm this. asking. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, the one state oh, that, idea came from, that came from Linda Ramsden and Mark Braverman and myself. Okay. I mean, the one state idea has been in the air for for a long time. I mean, that was for many many years the the uh, the program of the PLO itself. I mean, the PLO began as a Palestine liberation organization. And its idea originally was to liberate Palestine. Um, and then it kind of got into the whole uh, two-state kind of a thing by the middle 1970s or so. But certainly the idea has been there. I would say uh, uh, it's been over the last maybe seven or eight years that a few small one state kind of uh, groups emerged. Awad can actually talk about that because he's been very involved with, with a group that's been meeting in Istanbul that, that, that I haven't been involved with. But there was, they, had, you know, they had meetings in London, there's been meetings in Munich, there's been meetings in the States, they had a meeting in Texas, for example, in Houston. Um, there's, there, you know, it's more of a network. It isn't really a, 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 you know, a bunch of organizations. And I think we share very much of the same, the same vision. Um, uh, I think our plan, if I can say this, our plan is, is more detailed and more thought out than the other plans. That I mean, when we, when we formulated our plan, we took 
the other, the London Declaration, the Munich Declaration, and so on, and we combine them. I think we've added a lot to it, but uh, um, there are a few, a few, I would say, nuanced differences that, that still have to be worked out. Um, one of them has to do with, um, with um, uh, you know, should the state be a secular state? Uh, some are very, you know, like Radha Karmi, you know, the, the Linda knows, and some of the people in London are very, very adamant that this has to be a secular state, and we have to say it's a secular state. Well, one of the problems is, of course, that uh, most Palestinians, and today, actually, the majority of Israeli Jews are not secular. <laughs> they're either religious or they're traditional or, uh, or, or whatever. So, you know, I think part of, part of the trick is, I don't want to say a trick really, but part of the trick is to, to frame this in a way that it, that it says things that, that people want, are would be willing to, to agree with without hitting red flag words. So for example, in our, in our project, so we don't talk about, in our program, we don't talk about a secular state. We talk about a state, a democratic state, who's, uh, where the authority to pass laws and to govern rests with the people. Well, that's a secular state. <laughs> you know, it rests with the parliament, it rests with the democracy, with the people, not with religious laws or, or anything else. But, but we're not avoiding the word secular so as not to set off and trigger opposition. I think people would agree, maybe even Hamas might agree, that yes, it's not such a bad idea that the people, uh, that the people rule, um, but they would be very put off with the idea of secular, for example. You know, there's another uh, a big issue, and that is that um, um, a lot of Palestinians, I think, you know, are very reluctant, and it's very hard for them to think in terms of one state from the point of view of normalizing with Israeli Jews. I mean, Israeli Jews become part of the state, of, of the one state with equal citizenship. That's not so easy for a lot of Palestinians to process. So there are some Palestinians and some of the other groups that are saying, well, let's forget this issue about nationalism. Let's just have one person, one vote. That's it. You know, that's the one, London group, for example, is very strong with that. Just one person, one vote. Um, uh, and that way, okay, we're all here, we're all equal, but, you know, they're not, then in that sense, they don't have to deal with Zionism or with Israeli identity or whatever. The problem with that, from our point of view, is that, you know, we're not living in Nebraska. <laughs> you know, it, it, we're not just a collection of voters, but there are national identities here. I mean, the group that Awad is a part of, Balad, uh, is, it, it, you know, puts a lot of emphasis on Palestinian national identity. The Palestinians have been fighting for their national identity for the last uh, 70, 80, 90 years or more. Uh, and with Israelis too, you know, to ask them to, well, you're not going to be Israelis or Jews anymore, you're just going to be voters, doesn't seem to be realistic. So we've had to find, again, a middle, a middle road. Binational was too much for most Palestinians, a binational state, because it forces them to admit the legitimacy of Zionism. Uh, and so our, the way we're approaching it is it'll be a democratic state, of equal rights of all its citizens, a, a normal democracy like Nebraska. Um, but it will also, there's a, a place in there where we also um, respect and protect the collective identities of all the peoples living here. So if you want to be religious, if you want to be Israeli, if you're, you know, a Palestinian refugee coming back, the re most of the refugees coming back have no concept of what a civil society means. They've never had a democratic country to live in. They don't really, they need a generation or two to come together to heal. They want to come back to Palestine as Palestinians. So that's, in other words, we have to find the balance between a, a collective space where people have their identities, get themselves together, have their narratives, have their ideologies, institutions, but at the same time, and this is the key to our program in my view, to, to nurture the beginning of a new civil society. A new shared civil society will begin to emerge as we live together 
as we work together, as we go to school together, and and a new um, a new civil society will come, come about. So it'll be, you know, you can choose. Do you want to live more in your own community? Do you want to integrate more? You know, but it, it, it allows that process to happen in which it's not only one state in terms of a, of a political entity, but, but really generally one new civil society. Let me just say one more little thing and then I'll, and then I'll stop. I know I'm going on too long. You know, what do I mean by a new civil society? Just, I have a cute little example that I use. Some of you might have heard it before. You know, <clears throat> well, in the, in the outside of the United States, in the United States, football is, but football is the NFL. In the rest of the world, football is soccer. <laughs> and it's a big thing. And in the FIFA standings, FIFA is the World Football Association, the Palestinian national football team has a higher ranking than the Israeli national football team. And, uh, and neither one has ever succeeded in getting into the World Cup. And that's a huge thing. And that, that's like 100 times bigger than the Super Bowl, the World Cup. I mean, can you imagine a time when we have our one state and we're just beginning, we're starting to know each other, we're, we're trying to find ways to live together. And all of a sudden, we, our teams are combined and we're strong enough to get into the World Cup. The, our, our, we don't have a name for the country yet, but our football team gets into the World Cup. I mean, just something like that would be a tremendous nation-building sort of an experience. So our program, I think, allows a normal life to, to, to begin to develop from which a new society and from which even the name of the country will emerge. We don't have a name for the country even today. So that's just a, a, a little bit some of the some of the issues we're talking about. Yeah, th thanks, Jeff. Uh, I've heard you use the uh, example of the uh, football team. Uh, it reminds me uh, with there's some similarities with right the rugby team in South Africa. Uh, exactly. Yeah, right. uh, Awad, I want to I want to ask you. Uh, this this connects to the one democratic state campaign, but it's a little off subject. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to the to ODS, but I, we I can't let you go from the uh, interview today without asking you about uh, the inequalities in the Israeli healthcare system during this time of pandemic. Um, that that the the pan, this coronavirus time has widened the gap between the majority Israelis and the minority Palestinians, uh, uh, in spite of the fact that the Palestinians make up a large part of the healthcare workers and first, first responders in the Israeli health system. So can you say a word about how Palestinian citizens of Israel, uh, uh, how they're receiving medical aid and treatment during this COVID pandemic but also about the great number of Palestinians uh, who, who are part of the medical and other frontline professions uh, playing critical roles during this time. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, as for the, the health system, you know, it's, it's not easy to spot the discrimination that is uh, being pursued by the state of Israel toward Palestinians. In fact, I'm not saying that the health system in the Arab sector is, is too bad, but it's much less, uh, uh, I mean, uh, adequate than in the, than in the, uh, the Jewish sector. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, the, you paid attention maybe that the international and the Israeli media celebrated the role of the uh, uh, Arab doctors in the Israeli system. You know, 17% of the, of the doctors uh, are Palestinians. But you know why? Because... Uh, Say that again. Say the percentage again for us. 17% of the doctors are Palestinians who are serving in Israeli hospitals. You know, because uh, uh, recently, most Israelis go to the high tech. And uh, Palestinians still, I mean, believe that... Uh, to be a doctor is a very good thing, the best thing for a Palestinian family. And it is like a, a source of a bride for a Palestinian family. This is how it happened uh, only after the uh, takeover of most of our lands because Palestinians were left with no land, with no source of 
living. So have, Palestinians have to go for to education. Yeah. And a, a, a considerable middle class has emerged among Palestinians inside the Green Line, which is really a good thing. And this is not, this did not happen because of the Israeli uh, positive policy towards Palestinians, but in spite of that, despite the uh, discrimination and uh, uh, repressive policy pursued by Israel against us, Palestinians have managed to, uh, to, to get uh, good education. And uh, we have tens of thousands of Palestinians, graduates, uh, students and graduates. So, I mean, but you know, when you celebrate uh, the, 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 this fact that Palestinian doctors are serving in uh, the Israeli uh, hospitals, because you know, you as a doctor, you, 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 you relate, you treat every person, you know, regardless of its, if his religion, of his nationality or gender or so on. But you know, uh, uh, that this, the media ignores the vast majority of the Palestinians because they celebrate that there are doctors who are mainly uh, engaged in healthcare, but they ignore the vast majority of Palestinians. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians are living under such a system of discrimination. And you know that 52% of Palestinians are under poverty line inside Israel, which is, you know, Israel is a very strong economy. It has a strong, very strong economy. It's, uh, uh, and it is, a, I know, among the, the, the most uh, advanced countries in the world. But at the same time, you can find that half of its non-Jewish population are living under poverty line. So this also reflected in the health system. I mean, that uh, Arab towns, for example, in the, in the south of Israel, in the Naqab, where about uh, 200,000, more than 200,000 Palestinians are living there, are uh, still, some of the villages are still unrecognized by the state of Israel, with no electricity, with no running water, and also with no adequate medical care. So, I mean, and uh, a few years ago, there was a big battle against the so-called proper plan, a plan which uh, aimed to uh, expel the Bedouins, the Palestinian Bedouins who are living there, and concentrate them on townships without a source of livelihood, like it did in the 70s and in the 60s and late 60s, you know. So, I mean, we are suffering from uh, all forms of from all, all forms of discrimination, we, and all discrimination, all spheres of, of life. So that is the fact that we are living in. Thank you both. Uh, I, I'd like for you both to weigh in on this one. These are questions from uh, uh, May Cycli and Bob Datz. <clears throat> uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, Newland Smith and Bob Datz. Uh, Newland asks, would the one democratic state have nuclear capability and uh, uh, maybe talk about, you know, uh, international treaties, that, you know, broaden that, but, but address his particular question. And uh, Bob asked about the example of Yugoslavia, where artificially united ethnic groups separated, sometimes violently, and he asks, is our species enlightened enough to toss off national religious identity long term, I mean, uh, uh, which is really what you're, what 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 you're asking, is it not? In, in the one democratic state campaign, when you talk about the creation of a new civil society. So anyway, uh, if you could both address both of those, I'd appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think. Um... First of all, it would be a nuclear state since uh, Israel has nuclear weapons. I think the, the idea, I mean, this is also an issue of Palestinians, you know. There's all kinds of other plans out there besides the one state. You know, there's binational plans. There's um, a thing called um, one country, two peoples. There's confederation ideas. I mean, there's all kinds of 
And the bottom line for Palestinians is when they hear all these things is who controls the military? Who controls the security? Who controls the, the uh, police? You know, that's, you know, and if you don't, if you can't respond to that, then they wander off and go get a cup of coffee. Um, so I think in our plan, you know, I mean, our plan has to be fleshed out a lot. We just have the outlines of a plan. But uh, I think our idea is that, um, that the, the military security will be fully integrated. I mean, it isn't, it isn't like Lebanon. It's not, it's not, there's no binational or multinational thing in which there's a key. You know, the president is this ethnic group and the prime minister is that ethnic group and the, ch the chief of staff is from somewhere else. It's really, it's really a democracy in, in which you're trying to get, uh, based on merit, actually, um, uh, the best, most professional people into the different, in, into the different uh, professions. And so the idea would be that it would be an army, a military, a police force of the people, of, of the country. And, and, and it, it written in our plan, we say that we, we're dismantling the structures of, 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 of domination and collectivity so that no group is able to dominate any other group structurally in our, in our kind of a system. Now, it's true that, you know, uh, look at Scotland. I mean, look at Canada even. You know, I mean, it's not easy in the U.S. in, in, in many ways um, for groups to live together. I think part of our assumption, maybe Awad can speak to this, part of our assumption is that, um, that um, you know, we b belong to the same country and that if you create a win-win situation in which it's good for everybody and everybody's prospering and, and, uh, and uh, you know, and everybody feels a sense of ownership in the country, that there's really no motivation to go break off. And, and you have your identity. It's not, we're not saying you can't be some, you know, you can, but, you know, there's no, really no reason to, to, to break off like that. Now, it could be actually, I mean, if you think about it the other way around, we're talking about a two-state solution that failed and now we want one state. But if you look at the UK or Brus or Belgium or, uh, you know, uh, some other you know, country, Spain and so on, maybe it goes the other way. Maybe you start out as one country or you have one country and then at some point the group say, look, we don't want to live together anymore. We, the, the Catalans, don't want to live with the Spanish, and we, the Scotch, don't want to live with the English. And then you, you, it doesn't have to, it could be like Czechoslovakia. It could be a more of, a, of a, an agreed upon separation. So maybe someday there will be two states <laughs> or more, or maybe the whole Middle East will begin to go back to the whole idea in the Middle East, you know, and, and Awad is actually inserted into our program uh, that we have to relate to the wider Middle East. You can't decolonize one country in isolation from the rest of the region. Well, the Middle East has never been a, a, a region of states. States are all artificial impositions of the Europeans. Um, but it's always been, multi the Middle East has always been multicultural. It's always been uh, all kinds of groups living together. And so I think maybe if we maybe take an EU model or take a bioregional model, the Kurds in northern Syria were playing with the, this model of, uh, uh, you know, Ochlan uh, had a model of uh, ec ecologic democracy and so on, communalism. I mean, there's a lot of models out there. And we, we I think one advantage we have is that uh, we, can, uh, we can begin to, uh, to, to be um, creative and, to, and, you know, we can anticipate these problems that other countries have had and try to come up with, uh, with different kinds of, of, of approaches, including in the wider Middle East. Maybe let's begin to think beyond states and how do we get back to, a, you know, the whole idea of bioregionalism, which is a very interesting idea, basically says there's two things that are most important to people. Their own community, even their own ethnic religious community and their, and their local community, their region, and global. And the stuff about the states in between are kind of, uh, are, 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 the, are the problem because the states are artificial. You know, uh, 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 you know there's some, uh, uh, well, I won't get it, but, but you know, so in other words, we can maybe find a way to, to get a, a coalition of uh, ethnic, religious, 
community groups in the Middle East together uh, and, uh, and, and, and find a kind of a structure that avoids the divisions that you have in states. And that way you can avoid a lot of these ethnic uh, divisions. I just, you know, it gives us a chance to kind of think creatively. Good. Thanks, Chef Awa. Do you want to weigh in? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, the question that you posed, in fact, uh, uh, is one of the many challenges and questions that we are faced with. And that is very natural that, you know, no, nobody, no group, in fact, neither our, our, ours even, has a definite uh, model uh, for the solution. But we have a vision. We should need a vision first. And then maybe life will respond to that. The dynamics of life, maybe over time, over the course of our struggle, the new models, different but defined model will, will, will emerge. But what we want to be, what we have to be aware of is that there is a bitter struggle and conflict going on for more than 100 years in this country. And there is need to end this bloodshed. There is need for a vision for those who are living here, who are killing each other. But first, we have to be aware that Palestine was invaded by a foreign colonial group. And that this is a colonial or settler colonial uh, struggle. So now, what, is, what are the options before us? Either the indigenous people usually either were exterminated or succeeded in uh, expelling the uh, colonialists or absorbing or living together with the indigenous. And now maybe the, 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 the South African model is one which inspires us more than any other model, in fact. There is the Algerian model, the latest two models where I know. The Algerian model that the uh, settlers left uh, uh, as a result of the Algerian resistance. He, although, as learned later, that even the refugees were, were, were offered a choice to stay there and become citizens in the Algerian state, but they refused, they left. So we have the, uh, the, the model of South Africa, and we know that also South African model is facing serious problems these days, social problems, the gap is growing. And yeah. this is why we can't copy any model completely. We should be creative, as Jeff said. We should be creative. What kind of model can fit for this kind of a, this type of a struggle? But we think that now, what is the reality in Palestine? It is a state, one state reality. That is a striking fact. Nobody can ignore that. That the state of Israel, more than any time before, is saying that we are in control of all of Palestine. That occupation in the West Bank and Gaza Strip is not uh, temporary. It is permanent. And it is issuing law, passing laws to perpetuate that. And the superpower, the biggest superpower in the world is supporting that. So what should we do? And, but the Palestinians are still there. The Israel, Israel, Israel that the Zionist movement succeeded in building a state in Palestine, but it has not, we can say that it has triumphed, finally. I mean, there is no decisive victory. Palestinians are still there. Half of the population who are living, was living in Palestine are Palestinians. And those who are in the exile are still uh, striving to come back. So the struggle continues, the problem continues, is living, and the Palestinian cause is still on the agenda of the world. So you can't say that I, will I keep controlling Palestine without a resistance. Palestinians continue to resist. It's right, they are weak, they are fragmented on the uh, level of their leadership. The Palestinian leadership is divided catastrophically. Uh, and, but the Palestinians on the ground, they are saying no to the settler apartheid system. They are not going to succumb to this reality. This could take tens of years. But why, as, as, as uh, I can evoke an argument with Rolf Mayer, who was the chief negotiator on behalf of the apartheid with the ANC. I, I asked him 
other son, but the about uh, uh, whether he expected the 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 the, the quick collapse of the uh, apartheid regime after he entered the negotiation. He said no, he didn't expect that. But I mean, uh, he would. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, the, 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 the Palestinians in 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 in, 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 in Palestine. Uh, are uh, uh, with even if the leadership, their leadership, are not advocating one state solution, but things are changing. The mindset is changing, and only recently, an important uh, research center, polled Palestinians, saying that 38 percent of Palestinians believe in the one state solution. This is contrary to uh, one year or two years ago, and where only less than 20 percent. Today, more than 60% don't believe that the two solutions is, via, is, is, is possible. And, but what is the, the, the challenge that one of the challenges standing before us is that even those who are really are frustrated with the two-state solutions among Palestinians have not decided finally on what kind of model should, they should impress. Yeah. So this is part of the Palestinians whom, whom we are engaging in, in, in with to convince them that we should embrace the one state solution. Of course, this doesn't mean that this only enough because there are groups with, in who, with whom I am, uh, from of which I'm part, who are trying to reunite the Palestinians because in order to really become uh, a powerful force, I mean, to effect a change, First of all, the Palestinian people should be united. If we, if Hamas and Fatah can't work together, so we should start from below, grassroots or mass mobilization. This is what many groups are trying, even intellectuals, uh, youth activists, uh, academics, uh, people right, people uh, 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 organize uh, smaller groups, uh, uh, mobil uh, mobilizations on the ground. So what I, I call this, that rebuilding the Palestinian liberation project from below, outside the structures of the leadership. So this is the only way to get out. If Palestinians can be reunited, then they really can uh, impact the Israeli society. If the Palestinians can come out uh, with their unity and with a new vision, of, uh, with, with a vision that uh, embraces uh, democ democracy, one democracy in all of Palestine, that can capture the imagination of certain sections of the society and also the freedom fighters around the world and civil society around the world. Like, like the ANC did, I mean, the ANC has been, was consistent in embracing one state, one man, one vote. This is what it should be done in, uh, for, for the Palestinians.